Okay, people are joining. I can see that. So uh, welcome to the annual Sir Frank Keto Public Lecture. My name is Professor Michael Adams and I have the honour of being the head of the law school. And we're really looking forward to hearing Professor Hilary Charlesworth speak. Before that, I'd like to just formally ask Marcel Burns to acknowledge country. Marcel. Hi, thank you. It gives me great pleasure today to do the acknowledgement of country for the annual Sir Frank Kiddo Lecture for the Law School. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Anawan peoples and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and also to acknowledge that these have always been places of knowledge, teaching and learning. I also acknowledge the Gamilaroi, Dungari and Gumbanga peoples who have cultural connections and responsibilities for caring for country. I'd also like to acknowledge traditional owners on the lands where Professor Charlesworth is located in Melbourne, the Bunurong Boon Warung and Warangiri Woi Rung, sorry, Warung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. So thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, Hilary, uh, you really don't need much of an introduction within legal circles. You are very well known and we're so pleased to have you um, talking on this very timely topic of human rights in the time of COVID-19. I'm sure everyone knows, of course, that you are a distinguished professor at Melbourne Law School, as well as, of course, at the ANU uh, College of Law and also a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Um, we are very much looking forward to your insights. Now, participants, if you uh, wish to have a question, can you please insert it into the Q&A down the bottom of your screen? At the end of the presentation, I will go through those questions and both Hillary and I and the panel here will be able to see and we'll be able to convey those questions. So Hillary, thank you very much. We look forward to hearing your presentation and you're most welcome to share your slides that I know you have on, on your screen. Hillary. Thanks very much, Michael. Can I just confirm that my slides are visible? Yep. Great, wonderful. Looking okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Good. Uh, Marcel, many thanks for your welcome to country and I want to join you in acknowledging the traditional owners of the Armadale area, the Anawan and Gamalaroi people. And also where I'm sitting today is actually, as you foreshadowed, on uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to the elders in both our two areas, past, present and emerging. Many thanks to Michael for your welcome to the University of New England. I'm only sorry I'm not there in person. Well, I'm extremely honoured. I was very honoured at the invitation to give this lecture named for Sir Frank Kitto. And I thank the university, Dean Michael Adams, and particularly Associate Professor Greg Kahn, who's graciously made all the arrangements <clears throat> for the lecture. Now, many of you will know that Sir Frank Kitto, this is a photo of the High Court in 1952, and you can see um, Sir Frank Kitto is the person, I hope it's the same for you, in the back, back right hand row. Um, at the front, of course, is, is the very famous Sir Owen Dixon, a great friend of Sir Frank Kitto. But Sir Frank was a Justice of the High Court for 20 years from 1950 to 1970. So he'd just been on the court for two years when this photo was taken. And then, of course, he was Chancellor of the University of New England throughout the next decade until 1981. So Frank was a thoroughly 20th century figure, born just after Federation in 1903, and he died in 1994. He attended government schools in Sydney and then the University of Sydney, where his brilliance and capacity for hard work were readily on display. After going to the Sydney Bar, Sir Frank built up a practice in equity and taxation law. One of his most famous cases as a barrister was his defence of the trustees of the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 1944. Uh, this was over the 1943 Archibald Prize. And at issue was whether the uh, image you see here, which was William Dobell's painting of his fellow artist, Joshua Smith, which had been awarded the Archibald Prize, was this truly a portrait or was this a caricature? <clears throat> 
So Sir Frank's argument that this was truly a portrait won the day over that of his opponent at the bar, Garfield Barwick. Must say alongside, there are two images here of Sir Frank. So there's one, a very formal high court photo, but I must say, I really like the other portrait, the portrait of Sir Frank painted by his son-in-law, the well-known Sydney artist, uh, Kevin Connor. You can see his signature right down in the corner. This prize, this portrait of Sir Frank won the Archibald Prize in 1975. Fittingly enough, after another controversy, the prize for that year had been initially awarded to John Bloomfield for a portrait of the film director, Tim Burstall. But it emerged that Bloomfield had painted the portrait from a photograph rather than from life as re was required by the Archibald rules. And so that portrait of Tim Burstall was disqualified and Connor's portrait of Sir Frank was declared the winner. To me, Sir Frank's famous reticence, his intelligence and his sensitivity are really beautifully captured in this portrait. As a judge, Sir Frank had a reputation as a brilliant technician with a deep commitment to the rule of law. In his swearing in speech in 1950, Justice Kitto said the following, Australia's future will be influenced in no small degree by the quality of the work we do in upholding the rule of law and proving its worth and effectiveness in the development of a nation in whose righteousness must lie its greatness. I hope Sir Frank would not disapprove if I take this reference to righteousness as my starting point of this lecture, expanding the term, no doubt, from the field in which Sir Frank meant it into the field of human rights. This year, and I, I just want to point out the, the image I have there is by the uh, Anangu artist, Elizabeth Wilson, um, in, uh, who paints at one of the art galleries near Mutijulu, near Uluru in Central Australia. And this, I, I have another, some of these images on other slides. Um, this is, is a painting on the dangers of COVID and you see uh, the white tourists coming to purchase from the local indigenous owners their, their artworks. So they're the black and the white horseshoes represented there. And at the back of the uh, indigenous people, are the marks, the signs of COVID, the COVID virus. Interestingly, these artists had not, at that stage when these paintings were painted back earlier in the year, hadn't seen any of the images of COVID, of the COVID virus that we see every night on our television screens. And these, these images of COVID were from their imagination. So it's, I think it's a very striking image there. So 2020 is going to be forever marked in local, national and international histories as the year of the COVID-19 pandemic. While there's been a lot of public discussion in Australia of the technical aspects of COVID, turning us all into amateur epidemiologists, much less attention has been paid, I think, to the legal framework for the regulation of the pandemic. And so in this lecture, I want to examine the impact and the implications of human rights during the COVID-19 era. I'm going to start by considering the global human rights framework and identify the guidance it offers in times of a public health emergency. I'll then turn to Australia to discuss the ways in which the language of human rights has been deployed in the context of this pandemic, as well as the human rights silences. My overall argument will be that a human rights framework is a valuable resource in the era of COVID-19 but in Australia, at least, it has been underused. A human rights framework is widely misunderstood here, not least by our politicians and executive branches of government. Let me turn then to the global human rights system. The global human rights system is an intricate network of institutions, offices, declarations and treaties. Its basic normative commitments are set out in the UN Charter, which was adopted in 1945. Uh, 70 years ago this year. This very general text in the UN Charter was elaborated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1948. And here you see an image of Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the primary drafters of the declaration holding a printed copy in 1950. 
The Universal Declaration is a remarkable document setting out a range of civil and political rights, as well as economic, social and cultural rights. And Australia has a very close association with the Declaration, uh, not least because our then uh, Foreign Minister, Dr H. V. Evatt, was the President of the General Assembly at the moment it was adopted in December 1948. Now famously, the Declaration is not binding, and it took another uh, almost two decades for the provisions of the Universal Declaration to be translated into treaty or binding form with the adoption of the two covenants, the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights and the covenant on civil and political rights, which were both adopted by the UN in 1966. And of course, there are also a series of treaties elaborating specific uh, rights or groups identified in the Universal Declaration such as the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention Against Torture, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention on the Rights of a Child, and so on. So uh, what guidance can we get from these treaties with respect to the protection of human rights in the era of COVID? Let me set out some of the major themes. Well, first of all, uh, the first thing that human rights, international human rights law does is to set up duties on states requiring them to take action. And one of the most important in the context of the pandemic, I just note that this other image is by another Anangu artist, uh, Polly Anamumu. Uh, and she there, you can see again her version of the coronavirus in the middle of the health center. And this is um, a meeting of the uh, Nangu people with health center staff. And you can see there's uh, uh, images of the brochures that have been, that are being used in education by the health, health center staff. But here, um, Article 12 of the International Covenant uh, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Australia ratified this treaty under Malcolm Fraser in 1976. So we're a full party to this treaty. And we've signed on to this commitment to the right to the highest attainable standard of health set out here. So you can see the words uh, of uh, Article 12, and you can see I've sort of edited there that uh, it refers to uh, the need for parties to this treaty to take all the steps necessary for the prevention, treatment and control of epidemic diseases, among others, and the need to create conditions that were sure to all medical attention in the event of illness. The committee that monitors this treaty, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, has in a general comment on the right to health, uh, told us, it's elaborated this right and told us that uh, it means that there should be a very solid system of urgent medical care in the case of epidemics. And uh, it also calls on all states to make available uh, all the technologies to improve and epidemiological surveillance and data connect collection and to base all of their measures on the best scientific advice. I note, just because this is a legal uh, context, uh, sorry, I think I've jumped over one, um, with Pollyanna Mumu's image again, Article 2 sets out the type of obligations that countries that have accepted the covenant sign on to. And you can see under Article 2 here that uh, there's a fair amount of wriggle room for states here. It just says every state party um, must, to the maximum of its available resources, with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of the rights. So it's not an obligation of immediate implementation uh, under this particular covenant. But uh, the next part of Article 2, Paragraph 2, is important uh, for my purposes because it says the right to the highest attainable standard of health has to be provided in a way that it entails no discrimination of any kind. But the force of Article 2 effectively is to say, well, a state's obligations under this treaty vary according to a state's available resources. So more is expected from wealthier states such as Australia than poorer ones. Another critical obligation provided for under the covenant on civil and political rights 
which Australia uh, ratified in 1980, is the right to life. And I have uh, a third image here from Yarichi Miller, also an Anangu artist from Mutitjulu. So uh, we know from, again, elaborations, international legal elaborations of the right to life, that uh, this includes the need to take all possible measures uh, to restrain the spread of life-threatening diseases. And my uh, colleague, Sarah Joseph, a very distinguished human rights lawyer now at Griffith University, she's raised the interesting question about whether the behavior of countries such as Sweden, who took the so-called herd immunity route um, in protection of, in response to the COVID-19 virus, whether that was in fact a violation of the right to life. But I won't linger on that point. My point is simply that under our international human rights treaty obligations, we have undertaken the duty in Australia to take careful positive action to preserve uh, the health of our communities. The next, so that's one thing that human rights law does is to impose these positive obligations. But international human rights law also uh, regulates responses to the pandemic and human rights. We know that uh, one of the most common, uh, common responses worldwide include lockdowns, uh, including school lockdowns and border closures. And one doesn't have to think too long to see that it's uh, clear that those responses uh, can well be in tension with human rights. And in fact, it's very difficult to think of uh, any human right uh, in the Universal Declaration that isn't affected by some of the COVID restrictions. Certainly, if we think of the rights at art in the Economic, Social and Cultural Covenant, things such as the right to work, the right to an adequate standard of living, and the right to an education, it's clear that those rights uh, are going to be affected by both uh, lockdowns and by border closures. And then if we look at some of the rights set out in the civil and political covenant, I've just listed some of them there, I won't go through them all, but it's very clear that all of these rights, and I could have listed the whole covenant, but all of these rights are going to be affected by government's responses to, uh, to the pandemic. So uh, I, I just was listening to the radio earlier this morning and hearing people who are uh, just being told in South Australia that they will have to undergo a second period of quarantine, people just about to come out of quarantine, facing another two weeks. And uh, some of them were talking about their rights to liberty in the face of this prolonged lockdown. So all of these things have been raising human rights issues. Um, on Article 25, the right to democracy, there's certainly been a fear widely expressed that responses to the pandemic have become a smokescreen for authoritarian governments. And here in Victoria, with our extended state of emergency, certainly some members of minor parties in parliament uh, were very, very critical of the government for uh, extending the state of emergency and the argument went precluding proper review of some of the government's uh, pandemic measures. So I should note to be precise that some of the rights set out in the two covenants have inbuilt in them the possibility of limitations. So here's article four of the, I beg your pardon, sorry, of the uh, covenant on economic, social and cultural rights. And you can see there that it states, well, you can, of course, limit the right to healthcare, the right to work, the right to education, and so on, but only by such limitations as are determined by law and insofar as is compatible with the nature of these rights. And it's always got to have the general welfare in mind. When we look at the rights set out in the civil and political covenant, I've just put out uh, the restrictions that are allowable in three particular rights, the right to freedom of movement that I'll focus on when I'm looking at Australia, the right to manifest one's religions and beliefs, and the right to peaceful assembly. And you can see that all of those, they're all slightly different formulations, uh, but they all allow restrictions on those rights 
uh, in the name of, among other things, uh, public health. So certainly these rights are within their own terms, they're not absolute. So one of the questions becomes, well, how do we, how do we assess restrictions on rights? How do we know whether they are reasonable or not? How do we know whether they are really uh, necessary in the terms of the covenants? Well, there has been a whole jurisprudence developed at the international level, indeed in many constitutional systems and particularly by the European Court of Human Rights saying, well, of course, rights, the exercise of rights can never be absolute, but there are some general principles. One of the principles is the principle of legality. In other words, that uh, the restraints on human rights must always conform with the law. And another very important aspect of restrictions is that they must be proportional uh, or necessary, that the minimal alteration of existing laws that is absolutely vital is made and that these laws are of limited duration. Uh, there's also a requirement that the laws should be capable of review and that there's some scrutiny of executive action. And it's also critical that the restrictions on rights do not contain their own discriminations. So uh, these rights, there are the rights, they can be limited, but the limits have to be legal, proportionate, and they have to be non-discriminatory. I just also note for the sake of completeness that the civil and political covenant allows, uh, sorry, um, formal derogations to be made from that particular treaty. And I noticed as of yesterday, 22 countries, I've listed them there, have made formal statements of derogation from the civil and political covenant, it's under Article 4. You can't do this under the economic social covenant. So it's interesting, most of them, as you can see, are from Latin America and Eastern Europe. Um, an interesting exception to that geographical spread is our more or less neighbour, Thailand. Um, it's interesting that Australia hasn't made a formal statement of derogation, but, uh, or perhaps given that there are uh, over 180 parties to the covenant. It's perhaps interesting that more countries haven't made these formal statements of derogation, but I, I leave that international legal curiosity to one side now. I want to turn from the global level to the situation in Australia. Well, talking about Australian human rights, at first blush, Australia displays a really impressive commitment to the principles of the international human rights system. It's a party to most of the core human rights treaties and it's accepted the right of individuals to make complaints about Australia's implementation of the treaty rights. However, that apparently rosy picture loses its glow somewhat when we turn to the incorporation of our international obligations into Australian law. Famously, the Australian constitution contains scant references to human rights and the High Court has, over its life, tended to interpret even those minimalist provisions very restrictively. Well, the um, problems of race, sex, disability and age discrimination are covered to varying degrees by Commonwealth and state legislation. But many of the other rights, the rights don't, that don't depend on discrimination contained in the two major covenants, aren't implemented at all in Australian law. So for example, there's no Australian translation of many of the economic, social and cultural rights, such as the right to health. And there are certainly no rights to freedom of movement, uh, freedom of speech or freedom of assembly. Now, some form of exception can be found in the Australian Capital Territory in Victoria and Queensland, which have all adopted human rights acts or human rights charters, but they're, it should be noted they're legislative only, those, uh, those three instruments. But I think it's fair to say overall in Australia, there's a deep seated belief held by both the major political parties that the lack of rights in the Australian legal system demonstrates the wonders of Australian democracy that Australian parliamentary debate and a robust opposition, and I'm quoting here from John Howard when he was prime minister, 
that together they ensure a magnificent system of rights protection. Well, so we have the great confidence of our politicians in protection of human rights, although very little sign of it in our legal system. So against this fairly bleak human rights background, I've been struck by how the COVID era has brought human rights language to the fore in public discussion. Generally, I think it's fair to say in Australia, talk of human rights has tended to have a left liberal edge to it, but it's striking that groups from all sides of the political spectrum now seem to be interested in it. I have here images uh, to Victorians. This is a very famous set of images. Uh, this is so-called Bunnings Karen. So there have been, but there are many other ones, there have been protesters against government mandated restrictions. This woman is actually, her name isn't Karen at all. She's giving all those Karens a bad name. Her name is Kerry Nash. And uh, she recorded herself invoking, I was really intrigued when I heard this, uh, the 1948 Charter of Human Rights. I assume she's referring to the Universal Declaration, but she actually invoked that in Bunnings. And you can see the poor manager of Bunnings who's being filmed here, when she refused to wear a mask while she was shopping. Uh, but these uh, talk about human rights isn't just uh, confined to these protest groups. The uh, Liberal Party Member of Parliament, Tim Wilson, complained to the Australian Human Rights Commission, of course he used to be Human Rights Commissioner there, that the Victorian curfew meant citizens' rights and freedoms were being limited, and these are his words, based on the ease and efficiency of the powers of the state against the rights and freedoms of Victorians. So we've got those complaints that human rights are being abused on the one hand. On the other, uh, politicians have insisted that talk of human rights is simply inappropriate in the pandemic. So my Premier, Daniel Andrews, rebuffed criticism of the curfew in Victoria by saying, and this is a quote from one of his press conferences, this is not about human rights, it's about human life. So quite interesting to a human rights lawyer pitting human rights against uh, human life. So I want to consider a few of Australia's responses to the pandemic using the yardstick of human rights. Well, first of all, although Australian governments have as I've said, avoided the language of human rights. In fact, they've adopted many actions, I think, that are consistent with human rights commitments, particularly under the economic, social and cultural covenant. So I think there's a good argument that Commonwealth policies such as uh, JobKeeper and JobSeeker uh, have alleviated the economic impact of the pandemic on workers and contributed to maintaining the right to an adequate standard of living under the economic, social and cultural covenant. Uh, I also note uh, there have been some laws such as here in Victoria and I think in a number of other states, laws that prevented evictions during lockdown periods, which support the right to adequate housing. And various forms of government programs uh, supporting online learning at schools, I think is also uh, consistent, of course, supports the right to education. But, uh, I've mentioned earlier the right, uh, the duty, I should say, of non-discrimination in rights protection that's provided for in both of the covenants that just saying in providing rights, you must not discriminate. Seems to me that uh, this duty of non-discrimination uh, should have been paid a lot more attention in Australia. We know, for example, that the impact of crises are never gender neutral and the pandemic is no exception. Uh, we know both within Australia and more broadly across the world, there's a recent report by UN Women showing that women and girls were especially harmed by the resulting economic and social fallout. Uh, women are losing their livelihoods faster because they're more exposed to hard hit economic sectors. We know also that violence against women uh, has increased around the world and in Australia things such as the widespread stay at home orders have forced women to shelter in place with their abusers, often with tragic consequences. Also having more people at home, especially children means that the burden of unpaid care and domestic work has increased for women and girls in particular. And we also know that women and girls in communities already marked by uh, 
Factors such as institutionalized poverty, racism, and other forms of discrimination are particularly at risk. They've faced higher rates of COVID-19 transmission and fatalities, and are most exposed to the secondary effects such as loss of earnings and livelihood. And I think we can see uh, in Australia that some of the responses to COVID-19 are uh, I don't think have taken enough into account the obligation of non-discrimination. I note from July, uh, childcare workers were excluded from JobKeeper while uh, more support was announced for the building trade, sort of showing much greater economic support for male dominated industries than for those where women are in the majority. I also note that policies and practices adopted during the pandemic in Australia have exacerbated other inequalities in our society. For example, we know that the health and situation of asylum seekers kept in detention in Australia has deteriorated. We know that the pandemic has had particular consequences on for people with disabilities, uh, reduction of care and support and so on. And uh, we also know how extraordinarily the aged have suffered from the pandemic. So uh, when measured up against our duties under the human rights uh, uh, covenants, I think Australia has performed pretty well, but it certainly should have taken the duty of non-discrimination more seriously. But let's turn to use uh, a human rights yardstick to assess pandemic response measures that restrict human rights. And because of the time, uh, I'm only going to look at one international human rights guarantee. And that's uh, the uh, Article 12, the right to freedom of movement provided for under the ICCPR. Now, we've had uh, some very high profile human rights advocates warn the Commonwealth restrictions on the return of Australian citizens and also state border restrictions within Australia that they could violate Article 12. So the president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, Professor Rob Ros Croucher, told a Senate Estimates Committee that she was very concerned about the implications of many Australian policies with respect uh, to the right to freedom of movement and also the right under the Convention on the Rights of the Child for parents and children to be reunited. And uh, in the, over the weekend, I noted that the famous um, expatriate Australian human rights lawyer, Jeffrey Robertson QC, uh, has argued that the caps on numbers of people coming into Australia are overly punitive. And he says, well, why are there these caps? Uh, a 14 day hotel quarantine should be enough. Uh, why should there be extra uh, caps on them? So there have been these uh, quite high profile uh, suggestions that Article 12 is being violated. Please note in paragraph three there uh, that there is the possibility for parties to the covenant to restrict right to freedom of movement on the basis of public health. How then can, should we analyze Commonwealth and state restrictions on the freedom of movement in light of Article 12? So it's an apparently a very broad right, but as I've just noted, it can be restricted if necessary. How do we make that assessment whether the restriction is necessary and how have Australian courts responded to these claims? Well, in the past two weeks, we had examples of two quite different judicial approaches to this very question, reflecting different parts of the Australian legal system. Uh, this face may or may not be familiar to you. It's quite familiar in Victoria. Uh, and I want to talk about the case of Gurner and Victoria. Uh, this was a claim by Julian Gurner, and this is his picture. Um, an own, owner of a very famous hotel in Sorrento, a much very popular bayside town outside Melbourne. He argued that the Victorian government's lockdown restrictions had impeded his right to freedom of movement that was implied in the Australian constitution. So Gurner's claim, which went straight to the High Court because it was a constitutional one, relied on the history of 
the constitutional debates. And he tried to locate a freedom of movement in a similar manner to the implied right to freedom of political communication that has been recognized by the High Court. He argued, and I'm quoting here from his submissions, such an implication as an aspect of freedom of political communication is consistent with a free and confident society. So he also linked the concept of freedom of movement to federation. And his lawyers, uh, who uh, his team of lawyers was led by Brett Walker, SC, they argued, well, um, the federation, if we're a federated country, this logically requires freedom for people to move within the Commonwealth. For its part, the Victorian government, who was the defendant here, rejected the argument that federation provided a basis for a broad implied freedom of movement. And four states and the Northern Territory intervened to support Victoria in these arguments. So Victoria argued, and again, I'm quoting from their submissions, that there's simply no foothold in the text or structure of the constitution to support a generally implied freedom of movement as pleaded by the plaintiffs. Uh, lawyers for Victoria also suggested, led by uh, Kristen Walker, uh, QC, our Solicitor General, also suggested the idea is contrary to existing High Court rulings and isn't supported by the drafting history of the Constitution. So for those interested in constitutional history, the submissions are well worth looking at. Well, the High Court, from my reading of the transcript, seemed to have taken four minutes in retiring and then coming back and dismissing the case. This is hardly surprising given the threadbare constitutional provisions, but, and we still don't yet have the High Court's reasons, they're yet to be published. But from a human rights perspective, the unsuccessful case reinforces Australia's failure to translate its human rights treaty obligations into national law. So we're left with our, our very slender, threadbare constitutional structure as the main bulwark against um, restrictions on rights. A second case was came before the Victorian Supreme Court and it was uh, Loilo and Giles. And this is Michelle Loilo, the uh, again Victorian cafe owner. And you can see there she's outside her cafe, she's holding uh, a copy of the writ. So this case, uh, the Loilo case, had a firmer legal framework perhaps in the Gurner case because it relied on the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities of 2006, which uh, implements indirectly much of the civil and political covenant, including Article 12. So her argument, Michelle Loilo's argument, was that the Victorian government's curfew had breached her human rights under the Victorian Charter. And she went on to argue it wasn't, using human rights language, a reasonably proportionate response to the pandemic. Now, Loilo failed in her claim. Uh, we got the judgment just two weeks ago, and uh, it was before a single judge of the Victorian Supreme Court, Justice Timothy Ganane. And the judgment is uh, very striking for Justice Ganane's careful account of the requirements of proportionality in assessing restrictions on human rights. Now, one of the things that Michelle Loilo in her claim seized on was the fact that the Premier Daniel Andrews had defended the curfew at more than one press conference by saying that it supported the work of the police in monitoring adherence to public health directions. I think it's clear from a human rights perspective that the rationale of enhancing law enforcement cannot pass muster as a proportional restriction on the right to freedom of movement. And uh, Justice Kinane went into a lot of detail about the actual decision-making process within the Department of Health and Human Services. And he reviewed all the evidence, endless emails and documents. And he found that the decision-maker, uh, Dr. Michelle Giles, had in fact properly identified public health reasons for the curfew. But I note that during the hearing, Justice Ganane called for further affidavit evidence uh, to satisfy himself that the Victorian government had actually weighed the human rights and public health considerations. So to conclude, there have been many different approaches internationally uh, taken to the pandemic. 
In Australia, our governments have relied heavily on medical advice as the basis for many restrictions on daily life. I just want to contrast two different approaches to that, perhaps two unlikely people to put side by side in a slide. On the left hand side is the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who has been uh, very critical of what he calls the techno medical despotism of Italian public health me measures, such as quarantines, curfews, and border closures. He's pointed out that illegitimate political power can be disguised as expertise. And I'm quoting from him here, he suggests that the emergency declared by public health experts replaces the discredited narrative of national security experts as a pretext to withdrawing rights and privacy from citizens. And Agamben has argued that the term, the concept of biosecurity now serves as a reason for governments to rule in terms of worst case scenarios. And he's, he's very, very critical of that. Uh, you'll need no introduction to the other person on my slide, of course, our former prime minister, Tony Abbott, who in a speech in London in early September made a different type of criticism of Australian government's pandemic responses. And he said, and I'm quoting from his speech, surely it's time to relax the rules so that individuals can take more personal responsibility and make more of their own decisions about the risks they're prepared to run. He said, well, they're clearly, he did concede there hadn't been enough attention paid to keeping coronavirus out of aged care facilities, but he questioned what he called a strategy of preserving almost every life at almost any cost. He went on to say, so far with Sweden, the most notable exception, governments have approached the pandemic like trauma doctors. Instead, he said, of thinking like health economists, trained to pose uncomfortable questions about a level of deaths we might have to live with. He went on to say, uh, we've probably, I'm not quite sure where he got his figures, but for each life we've apparently saved in Australia, it's cost us about $2 million. And he went on to say, and if the average age of those who would have died is 80, even with roughly 10 years of expected life left, that's still 200,000 Australian dollars per quality life year, or substantially beyond what governments are usually prepared to pay for life-saving drugs. So Tony Abbott, in other words, is putting, if you like, a classic uh, one, might even say crude utilitarian response, which is measuring uh, measures by really how much they cost and working out the value of life compared to that. Those two approaches are, I think, both of Agamben and Abbott, as different as they are politically and philosophically, uh, both their positions, I think, are in tension with a human rights approach, which has the principle of non-discrimination at its core. Much of the debate here in Australia has been cast between one, between expert epidemiologists on the one hand and rational business people on the other. But there's been remarkably little attention to a human rights lens. I think it's particularly surprising to see this in Victoria with our very strict restrictions among the toughest in the world, given the Victorian Charter of Human Rights, which requires that all government action be designed in light of human rights. I think there's little sign that human rights have been considered within Victoria or within Australian government decision making. The general Australian idea seems to be that we should simply trust the executive branch to act wisely and that in times of crisis, human rights are really an optional extra. My argument by contrast has been that human rights should be the center of pandemic responses. A human rights approach requires governments to take both positive actions to ensure its population can lead lives of dignity and equality and to ensure that restrictions on rights are proportionate. To end there where I began with this uh, wonderful portrait of Sir Frank. Sir Frank Kitto had a steadfast commitment <clears throat> to the rule of law manifested as Michael Kirby has shown in his writings on Sir Frank, manifested most particularly in Sir Frank's judgment in the Communist Party case delivered uh, that was heard just six months after Justice Kitto joined the High Court. While he might have been surprised to see his name associated with the topic I've addressed, I hope Sir Frank might agree that today 
a human rights approach is critical to achieving the rule of law, especially in challenging and unpredictable times. Thank you, Professor Charlesworth. That's uh, um, an amazing clarity that you've brought to this discussion, both contemporary uh, from what's happening in Victoria to around the world. And for a fun fact that um, Archibald winning painting is actually hanging here on campus. It's up uh, where the VC uh, is located in Bulamimba, which is the big house on campus. So any one of us can go up and see that painting for free at any time, which is lovely. So thank you, Hilary. Really appreciate your, your insights and thoughts. You'd be glad to hear, and you may be able to see as well, uh, we have five questions that have already come in. And so if I may, now six, I will put them to you uh, and, uh, and then obviously answer as you feel appropriate, if that's okay. So the first one uh, is, are circumstances precluding wrongfulness, particularly necessity and force majeure, relevant notably in the light of the principle of proportionality? From Artavio, our colleague, uh, an associate professor here, who's actually currently in Canberra. Uh, I think you can also click on the questions, Hilary, and you should be able to see them as well. Okay. Um, I'll just, thank you, uh, Octavia, I'll just. Uh, Octavio, I might just need to get you to be slightly more specific. Obviously, uh, necessity is critical. In fact, it's sort of built into the principle of proportionality. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I think uh, to answer your question, I hope I'm just understanding it. I, it, it probably is a very, oh, sorry, I'm just being reminded that the, um, the questions aren't visible to you. So I'll, I'll just repeat it again. Are circumstances precluding wrongfulness particularly necessity and force majeure relevant, notably in light of the principle of proportionality. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm not doing justice to the sophistication of the question, but as I say, I, I mean, necessity is built into the principle of uh, proportionality. And Greg Kahn is, I think, offering to respond to that question. I'll willingly hand over to Greg. I'm not offering Hillary. I think there was an email intervention because it's running through my account. But I realise the questions are actually broad principles of international law and tying them down to uh, the context in which you've given a great lecture. I think it's very difficult. I'd agree with you. So perhaps we could take that question on notice. That's what I'd suggest. Yes. Uh, Thank you. So our second one is an anonymous question. It says, uh, I am dismayed that Australia has a lack of rights listed in our legal system. My question is about freedom of expression in this unprecedented time. Isn't it illegal to put the onus to prove legality or actions expression on the individual? In other words, does the individual need to prove what he or she is not or has not done? I think that this is highly discriminating and at the very least it's dangerous. Well, thanks for that question. And again, I hope I'm, I'm going to do justice to your question. I think that um, it, it often does come as a shock to people who don't work every day with the legal system to realise that the Australian, Australian legal system has very few rights built into it. As I mentioned, discrimination is probably covered uh, pretty well in Australian laws at all levels, but other forms such as freedom of speech is, 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 is not protected in our legal system. Now, the High Court, as I mentioned in passing, has identified a, an implied right in the Constitution. It's not there in the text of the Constitution. It was implied a right to freedom of political communication, but it's only a certain form of freedom of speech. It's not freedom of speech. Um, understood very broadly. So I think that, uh, yes, effectively, if, if there were, and this, is, this actual issue has come up very pointedly in Victoria in relation 
to some of our restrictions that precluded public gatherings, um, a person was arrested after he put a call out, I think on Facebook or somewhere, to come along to a gathering, observing all COVID restrictions, but an, an anti-lockdown gathering. And he was arrested and charged um, for simply putting out that call uh, to that meeting. And he is in separate legal proceedings. I understand there are at least, I think there are a dozen cases winding their way through Victorian courts about the restrictions. But his one is precisely saying uh, to actually call for uh, people to have a meeting, not to breach restrictions, but to sort of get together and to discuss these things and to hold a political protest. I should be able to do that. But certainly under Victorian law, we haven't, the case hasn't been heard yet. And it'll be interesting to see to get to the Supreme Court, what the Supreme Court will make of that. It seems to me pretty clear that uh, there is a question of freedom of speech in that case. And, uh, and it's, it doesn't seem proportionate to stop people communicating on Facebook about these issues. So, but it will be up to the person who's been charged uh, to make that case. So it is, the onus is on him. So uh, yes, we are, I think at the very time that I'm speaking, I understand the president for the Law Council of Australia is giving a, um, a speech at the National Press Club calling for an Australian Charter of Rights. So um, that's, these issues are very, very much being discussed at the moment. Yes, it's, it's sort of perfect timing in those sort, sort of areas. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. Our next question is, have, have us, has Australia and other states correctly implemented the 2005 health regulations of the World Health Organization? Uh, I see that's from Otavio again. <laughs> <laughs> Otavio, I, 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 I can't I can't say anything useful about that. I haven't studied that, and I simply I simply don't know. I um, would be happy to take that on notice. Yes, yeah. I've got a feeling yeah. okay. Otavio might uh, know. Uh, yeah, yep. sure. And Otavio is one of our international lawyers here, at, uh, right. uh, and somebody else is actually uh, uh, adding an, another comment. Oh, okay, next we have uh, Amy asking a question, which is, I'm wondering about these rights are balanced in regards to maintaining the economy. So I guess uh, you, you discuss the trade-off of certain human rights, but this is focusing that balance from that, not just the health perspective, but from the economic perspective. Yeah, well, thanks, Amy, for that question. Obviously, it's, it's very difficult. The, the health of the economy, which in a way, it, it has been the health of the Australian economy that has allowed support for human rights through JobKeeper and JobSeeker programs, so uh, in a sense, the economy, keeping the economy going is really vital. But so these things do have to be taken into account and a human rights approach doesn't mean you have to put protection of human rights above everything else. And as I've said, you know, the right to work, the right to an adequate standard of living are all part of human rights guarantees. But, um, I suppose I was, in my remarks, I was trying to respond to the rather um, unvarnished economic utilitarian approach espoused by Tony Abbott that if I'm, and I've only, I've just read his speech and I, I, I so, but I, I don't know if I've got full grasp on his approach, but his speech in London in September seemed to be taking a fairly hardline economic rationalist argument, simply just saying, let's count up the number of years of life and work out whether we are willing to pay $200,000 uh, each year for the life of somebody over 80. So yes, it has to be built in, uh, but not, I would suggest, I would venture to the extent that Tony Abbott was suggesting. Thank you, Hilary. I'm, I'm just going to skip over Octavio's next question. Octavio, I will come back if we have time. But Dr. Monique Comia, well, I think you know Monique and a great colleague here, says, thanks for your great presentation, Hilary. You mentioned the question of Sweden potentially being in breach of its international human rights obligations. Could you give us your view on whether you think a government's policy to deliberately balance rights in a way that prioritizes freedom of movement and assembly 
and economic activity would in fact be in breach of the two uh, particular covenants you referred to. Yeah, Monique, hello. <laughs> I miss you at Melbourne. Uh, and uh, a great question. Uh, the, the critical word in your question is, is balance. Um, how does one how does one balance these things? I'm not saying it's easy or straightforward, but uh, if certainly, I, I suppose, if one's looking at the uh, right to the highest attainable standard of health under the economic, social and cultural covenant and looking at the general comment on the right to health, it's clear that uh, the right to health during a pandemic, the right to good health, is given an enormous amount of weight. And uh, as I've uh, mentioned, you know, in, in, in the other rights, there is always some allowance made for the dictates of public health. It's always going to be a difficult balance. Uh, my point is that governments don't seem to enough address the balance. They simply will pursue uh, one agenda over the other. And uh, it's, it was very interesting reading Justice Kinane's judgment in the Loilo case to get some insight. It's quite a lengthy judgment because it goes into a lot of detail about all the interactions within the department, how much notice was taken of the lawyers who were saying you might have a human rights issue here, how much notice was being paid to the pressure that seemed to be coming from the Premier to support the curfew and so on. So um, I don't, it's never going to be giving priority to one over the other. It's always going to be uh, a difficult balance in the context of a particular society. I'm certainly not an epidemiologist nor an expert on the Swedish measures, but from what I understand, the, uh, the decision to allow economic activity, social activity and free movement uh, seem to pay very little attention to the public health advice that the government was receiving. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time. And by the way, can I just say to our, our, our participants in, this, in the um, Keto lecture, that it's great to have so many questions, but I think we have time for probably two more. Uh, this next one says, what could the role of international human law be to obtain free childcare in Australia and redress the economic harm that women, which are, uh, you highlighted in your speech, have mostly been suffering from during the COVID crisis. Thank you, um, Elodie, for that, for that question. Yeah, I think that uh, the issue of free childcare, and of course this has become recently a point of political divide between the two major parties with, Labor, with the Labour Party recently announcing some changed policies here. But uh, seems to me that uh, human rights arguments could certainly be marshaled in support of uh, free childcare. We have uh, not only the um, we, not only the civil and political covenant and the right to work, which is set out in the economic, social and cultural covenant, would certainly support those. But also, of course, the treaty, the convention uh, that on the elimination of discrimination against women, that would certainly, there've been a number of uh, general recommendations from the committee that monitors that, pointing out the necessity of free childcare to women's right to work. So I think a very good argument could be made, uh, a human rights argument on this basis. And uh, it's perhaps why we need more women in politics uh, so that these issues are taken more seriously. Um, Hilary, what I'm gonna try and do is combine two last questions because they both deal with vaccinations. One's from Elizabeth, one's from Angela. And the one says, and you can, I'm happy if you're able to, to blur it as our last question. Regarding vaccination to COVID, if it was made compulsory, how could one lawfully refuse? And they sort of follow up or equivalent to a question. Do you see circumstances where a COVID vaccination could be made mandatory? So to end with, I guess we've had all the scientific uh, advice coming out that there are some vaccines possible with a 90 you know plus uh, level of success 
what do you think about from a legal perspective and the human rights perspective actually making them mandatory or uh, et cetera? Yeah, well, again, that's they've they've all been great questions, and those are those are great questions, and there's there's quite a bit of discussion about it. I think uh, it would be, from a human rights perspective, it'd be very very difficult to make vaccinations mandatory because uh, the nature of the vaccination uh, in our society would involve. Uh, Imagine forcing people to vaccinations would be an extraordinary um, issue. There'd be issues of detention and of, uh, you know, if you wanted to resist it, cruel uh, and degrading treatment. So I think it'd be very difficult. There uh, usually are provisions in all of these programs for conscientious objection. And I think that those would be supported at um, by by human rights law. One can imagine that if it turns out that 100% um, vaccination is absolutely vital to the success, I, which I don't understand to be the case with the current uh, candidates for vaccination, uh, that would raise quite different issues. But I think uh, a, a human rights approach has to allow the possibility of conscientious objection to, uh, to a vaccination. Of course, the Australian government has uh, come up with different forms of pressure in other vaccination contexts. The uh, no jab, no play um, policies at school, and so on. Uh, but um, yes, these these are these are critical and very very difficult questions. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Greg has actually just kindly pointed out that we, we actually uh, scheduled to 2.10, so if you don't mind, we've actually got a few more minutes for more questions. And so there's some great questions that have, that have come in. Um, if that's okay with you, Hilary, we'll just do a few more minutes. Um, Noel is asking, in Victoria, um, the executive had to put human rights centre of their decision-making. Do you think the lockdown would have evolved differently? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure the government would say, look, we did put it at the centre of uh, decision making, but I, all I would say is I'm not, I don't work within the government. I've searched for signs on it, of it, and it doesn't, it, it isn't, I haven't seen that it's, uh, it's not been obvious to the, uh, to those on the outside. I think some aspects of it would have been different. I think that the um, I think the curfew should have been entered into with much more care. Uh, it did look like it was simply a convenience measure sort of thrown in. I don't think it was ever justified very well. It's it's true that for the purposes of the litigation. Uh, there was uh, certainly Justice Ganane was convinced, but just as a Victorian resident, it seemed to the Premier was certainly giving out quite uh, a different message and nobody seemed to want to own the curfew. Uh, Chief Health Officer said it wasn't his idea, the Head of Police said it wasn't his idea and so on. So I think the curfew should have been much more carefully, uh, more carefully formulated. I think the other things that the aspects of a lockdown, for example, the one, the aspects that have allowed, um, I think the closure of political protest, even if it was um, trying to meet the restrictions in terms of numbers and masks, I think has been heavy handed. So yes, I think that uh, there, uh, I, I mean, there are many aspects of the lockdown I think probably were justified by the public health exigencies and uh, but there were aspects of it that seemed to be it was very difficult to work out was it just a particular lobby that managed to get particular exceptions one of the things that caused a lot of grief in Victoria was well mask wearing was mandatory but not for those um, people who were huffing and puffing, people doing jogging and so on. Some of the distinctions seem to be um, without, as many letters to the editor of The Age used to record, uh, without, without a very clear justification. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, and I, and I guess it was a moving feast, wasn't it? In that sense, decisions are being made on the on the run. And um, there's two uh, questions from Susan, which again we may be able to combine. Uh, one is, uh, do you feel the Human Rights Council has given members enough guidance during the pandemic? It seemed to take a long time for the presidential statement to come out in June 2020, and then the follow-up states, it seems that the Secretary General was much clearer and faster providing human rights guidance to UN members, and then a thank you for your excellent lecture. Uh, what's your response to that, Hilary? Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, I think obviously what's happened in many UN organizations, especially in the Human Rights Council, that the, the polarization of the international community over who was at fault, was it China? And the particularly, I suppose, the eagerness of the Trump administration in the United States to sheet home blame for the pandemic to China meant that it was quite difficult to get some UN bodies, such as the UN Human Rights Council, really going on the pandemic, saying useful things. And I think that was due to that uh, superpower rivalry and the, the, the immediate politicization of the pandemic that I think has really slowed down the response internationally. I do note that, um, uh, bodies that report to the Human Rights Council, the special procedures, many of the special rapporteurs uh, in the Human Rights Council have been very active in making statements, sometimes jointly, sometimes separately. Uh, there've been, I think, some very useful guidance and also by the UN treaty bodies. So I think that, and as, as you yourself note, the Secretary General has been very active in this and various arms such as uh, UN women also have been doing a lot of work on guidance in um, human rights protection in, in, in the pandemic. But uh, unfortunately, these international bodies, um, as you know, perhaps better than anyone, can be really slowed down uh, if one sets them up in this confrontational way that I think the US and the China sort of faced off over responsibility yeah. for the pandemic. Yeah. Thank you, Hilary. Um, there, you can probably see there are some questions from colleagues Same and Eric and, and another one from Amy, um, but I am conscious that we're, we're just coming up to our time and I just really wanted to formally thank you very much for your very insightful 2020 Sir Frank Kido lecture. Um, you've brought together some amazing themes in this, uh, I feel sad to say, unprecedented times that we're living in. We thank you for your time and energy in your preparation for this in-depth look. And it, and it does show the tensions of international law, international human rights law, domestic law, right down to the way Victoria has handled things very differently to New South Wales and, and Queensland. And now we're looking at what's happening in South Australia. And uh, you know, the political forces at stake here have, um, I think everyone has accepted that I think we, there's been a, uh, a good heart in terms of trying to do the right thing, but conflicting medical evidence, uh, legal enforcement, all those other aspects. And sometimes it is certainly felt too strong and other times too soft. I mean, getting that balance right, as you mentioned. Um, I particularly wish to thank actually uh, Social Professor Greg Khan for his time and effort in putting together both our Kirby seminar series, but obviously our highlight is the Sir Frank Kiddo public lecture. And we do miss the fact that you would have been normally here and we usually do this in our town hall as part of the community and last year we had I think about 220 odd people there so at uh, some future time Hillary would love you when there is freedom of travel and you're able to be here. Obviously I want to, to thank Marcel for her acknowledgement of country but mostly Hillary thank you very much for your time and effort today. I found it incredibly insightful. And also lastly, obviously, uh, we had 58 participants that we know of who were watching and I'm sure they all enjoyed it. So on behalf of the UNE Law School, thank you very much for your time and your, your insights today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. Uh,